Welcome to the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast. I'm Aaron Goodman, host and founder of the podcast. I'm a journalist, documentary maker, university instructor, and communication studies researcher. And I've lived with multiple chemical sensitivity, or MCS, for years. MCS is also known as environmental illness, chemical intolerance, and toxicant-induced loss of tolerance, or TILT. And it affects millions around the world. As you know, many people with the condition are dismissed by healthcare workers, employers, friends, even family. Countless people with MCS struggle to find healthy housing and get accommodation at work and school. And we suffer in all kinds of ways. The purpose of the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast is to help raise awareness about MCS and what it's like for people who live with it. We featured interviews with some of the world's leading experts and researchers on MCS and lots of people with the condition, and we're just getting started. If you like the podcast and want to support it, please find links on the website and in the show notes. Your help allows us to continue making the podcast and create greater awareness about MCS. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. This is episode 30, and the title is Powered Air Purifying Respirator Masks. Maybe you've wondered would wearing a PAPR, a powered air purifying respirator mask, allow you to be engaged in the world and stay safe from chemicals that affect you? Or maybe you've worn a PAPR. The reason we're focusing on this topic is because, as far as I can tell, there isn't a great deal of information about PAPRs that's widely and easily available. So I turned to a couple of people with MCS who have a lot of personal experience wearing PAPRs. You'll hear me speaking with two women with MCS who live in the United States. Both have MCS and have years of experience, again, wearing PAPRs. They talk about how effective they are for them in blocking chemicals and how these masks have effectively allowed them to continue engaging in work and in social life. They also talk about different models of masks they've used and how others, including family members, friends, and strangers, have reacted and how they've met some of these challenging situations. You'll hear Kyle Doughty Higgins, who lives in New York State. She developed MCS in 2019 while working as lead scenic artist, working on Broadway theater productions. Kyle had to leave her dream career, but has since found ways to be in the public in limited ways, often by wearing a paper. Kyle now serves as the scenic designer and scenic artist for Lehman College in the Bronx in New York, where she is an adjunct faculty member. She also works as a scenic designer for the Bronx Opera. Marianne Martin grew up in Pennsylvania in the U.S. and spent most of her professional life in Kansas. She now lives in Pennsylvania again. Marianne was a high school English and college theater instructor in her earlier healthy life. She was exposed to multiple toxic molds in the basement theater where she worked and developed MCS over 20 years ago. As with most people, her health collapsed, left her unable to work. Determined not to spend the rest of her life housebound, Marianne eventually decided to wear a powered air purifying respirator or PAPR whenever she leaves her home. And Marianne says it's not a cure and it took a while to get used to wearing it, but she says she's grateful that it has helped her live more independently for the past 17 years. I hope you enjoy the conversation and find it a benefit. You'll soon be able to watch a video of this episode on our YouTube channel. We're a small team, so it may take us a bit to get it online, but it will be posted. And there are a lot of other episodes up there in, in audio format to you to check, for you to check out on YouTube. If you like, just go to YouTube, search for the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast, and soon you'll, you'll be able to see Kyle and Marianne showing their masks and you can see what it looks like to wear a PAPR. Just a short note to say that nothing in this episode or in any episodes of the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast should be considered as medical advice. And importantly, do not attempt to wear a PAPR or respirator mask if you have asthma or any other breathing challenges. We release new episodes twice a month. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Find us on social media. 
Just search for the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast or Podcasting MCS. Leave your comments about anything you hear and please share the podcast with others. If you'd like to read transcripts of the podcasts, you can go to the podcast website, which is chemicalsensitivitypodcast.org. Click on the episode you want and then click on transcript. Or you can find, as I said, the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast on YouTube and read captions in any language you like. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's a great way to help others learn about the podcast. And if there's someone you'd like to hear interviewed on the podcast or a topic you'd like us to explore, just let me know. Email info at chemicalsensitivitypodcast.org. And thanks for listening. Thank you so much for joining me today, Marianne and Kyle. It's great to connect with you. Thank, Thank you. you. Good to be here. Yeah. So Kyle, would you like to start us off and just say a little bit about yourself or folks who are listening, perhaps where you live, and as much as you're comfortable sharing um, the kind of work you do or did and some of your experience with MCS, a bit of the history? Yeah, so I grew up in Seattle, and I came out to New York City for graduate school in uh, theater set design, and um, uh, inter- it's interesting to me that Mary and I, and Marianne and I were both in theater. Right. Um, uh, let's see, so set design, uh, when I graduated, I got into the Union for Scenic Painting, uh, and I, um, so for the last 30 two years or something like that. I've been working as a professional scenic artist in the industry, uh, primarily working in scene shops, uh, painting scenery for Broadway shows. And um, three and a half, four four years ago, um, I was hit with chemicals. I mean, obviously I've been hit all my life, but it, my body finally said, that's enough. Um, I, uh, reacted started strongly reacted to something in the scene shop and it was a cleanser so they they had a new company come in using a different cleaning product than had been used before and it just took my feet out from under me I didn't know what was going on um I had high anxiety I could smell something that no one else was smelling and finally my employer worked with me and they changed to a different cleanser and that seemed to resolve it um and then i think maybe and that was actually probably five years ago and then maybe a year after that um i think some i think people's deodorant and stuff like that um just put me over the edge uh Mm -hmm. again didn't know what was going on um and finally i had a whole body rash um finally was sent to a dermatologist who did and by this point Being in our industry, I know that, you know, we're exposed to chemicals, right? And uh, with the occupational um, uh, hygienist for our union, she has talked about this kind of thing that you can become sensitized. So I um, knew that. And when my doctor sent me to a dermatologist, I said, I need to be tested for chemical allergies. Sure enough, you know, it took a long time to get that done because you had to get off of steroids. You had to get off of antihistamines let your body clear out of those. And uh, finally found that I am uh, physically allergic to six chemicals, all of which are in the scene shop and many of which are in everyday products, primarily propylene glycol, which is in everything. So uh, from there, it evolved to my reacting to smells. So eventually I finally said, you know, I'm going to take a month off of work see if I can just calm my system down and see what happens. It helped. It helped a lot. Um, I went back to work and the the rash started coming back a little bit, but not as much. Um, And by this point, I was in contact with an occupational medicine doctor at Mount Sinai who said, yeah, this is a thing. Now, he would not say a name, give a name to this. He would not say this is MCS. This is not environmental illness. Um, But he said, there are others like you. 
this is this is a thing you are reacting to your environment and mm -hmm. he helped, helped me get through a uh, workers comp case uh, mm -hmm. in in following that up i then reached out to um, i found a therapist who also also has mcs and she led me to an environmental medicine doctor who started turning myself around, turning me around with uh, supplements and, and you know, testing everything and da 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 da, -da as they do. Um, so long story short, short-ish, uh, I am now working with a functional medicine doctor because she's only a half hour away from home, whereas the environmental medicine doctor is five hours away. Um, and she's continuing the work. She knows the environmental medicine doctor. She mm -hmm. knows what that gal does. And she has said to me, I don't think I can cure you, but I think we can stabilize you. Mm -hmm. And I would say I am stable to this yeah. day. You know, I am stable. I um, continue my regimen. And when I joined that doctor, she said, you are doing a phenomenal job, mm -hmm. which is I was following what the environmental medicine doctor did. Yeah. Yes, it takes money. The uh, These people don't take insurance. Um, but the functional medicine doctor, I will say, is cheaper than the environmental medicine. Um, and she you know, knows what I'm going through. Yeah. May I just ask, have you been able to keep working? I, uh, I went back to, I had to quit the, the, my professional, uh, employment. So, you know, leaving scenic art, uh, it was, um, incredibly hard. You know, you go through the, the, um, um, morning as, you know, it's a morning process to leave, to lose your job and your family and, you know, your work family and doing what you love. It was my dream job. Um, I floundered as I continued to physically help get healthier. I continued to flounder. And eventually, um, the uh, uh, Lehman College is where I, I'm working now. Uh, my husband works there. <clears throat> and when they found out that I was no longer working at this other shop, um, which took my priority because I was the union shop steward. Um, so they finally said, oh, well, we'll hire you. Come design more sets because I've designed for them off and on over the tw last 12 years. And so knowing that I was now really available, they grabbed me up. So I am now working as their set designer. Um, <clears throat> and I just, uh, for the theater department, I also just designed a show for the Bronx Opera who uses our theater as well. And then they, uh, about a year ago, hired me to teach uh, part of a, intro to uh, scenery, uh, mm -hmm. physical scenery. So I'm teaching okay. basically the uh, set design. Okay. So we're going to, in this conversation, we're going to, this is a segue as we move into talking more about masks and your experience with all kinds of masks. And we're going to loop back and ask you, I want to ask you how you've been using masks in your, in your work. Um, but Marianne, would you like to, to share with us uh, about your own, about yourself? Yes, I grew up in Pennsylvania and ended up working most of my professional life in Kansas. And I was a theater teacher and public speaking teacher, theater director. My theater, unfortunately, was in a basement and had water intrusion and grew several toxic molds. I stuck it out as long as I could and finally realized if I don't get out of here, I'm going to die. And so I quit my job and left and realized I was reacting to absolutely everything. So uh, that was 21 years ago. And so I've been dealing with MCS for 21 years and I miss theater, but I don't want to go back to it because I now also have chronic fatigue syndrome. And so I don't have the energy for it, but I am doing a little bit of work with, um, teaching online. But before I found the teaching online, I was doing uh, writing and photography for my local newspaper, just a small town newspaper. But I was wearing my respirator to do that job. And so I'd be happy to talk about that. That'd be wonderful. So maybe if you want to let us know, you know, you mentioned 21 years ago, over that time period, you've I'm guessing used a, a number of different masks. Did you start with, you know, smaller masks, face masks, cloth fabric, respirators, and kind of get use more different kinds? Did you start to use different kinds as time went on leading up to the full face mask? Can you talk about a little bit of that progression? 
Yes, of course, I started with just the simplest mask uh, because I didn't really know what it was, but I knew when I had a mask on, I felt better. Um, I connected with some online groups and found a mask called I Can Breathe, which is designed for um, MCS. And it's a small mask that has some charcoal in it. And so that was helpful, but um, I still really reacted to many, many things if I went out of the house. So I was pretty much housebound for two years. Uh, I tried the the big kind that has the the filters here and the big, um, but I reacted to the smell of this thing mm -hmm. and could not get over it. I ended up wearing the I can breathe mask under this mask and then mm -hmm. I go out without reacting but I couldn't do anything like walking right. because you couldn't get the air in yeah so I think you're for people who are listening I think you may be referring to a, like a 3m oh. half respirator right right the kind that goes over your nose and mouth and uh I, I yes I forget we're we're, vis we're er, are all no one can see what I'm doing with my yeah with my... we're recording video and audio so yeah 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 so that's helpful yeah. I am very fortunate that I found an online support group fairly early and um, my my doctors and everyone, even other MCS people were basically saying, get used to being in the house. And I could not handle that thought. <laughs> uh, so I found a woman online whose husband sold industrial supplies. Mm. And she sent me pictures of herself in the grocery store wearing this um, and walking. She told me she can walk along the side of the road. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it. But I was so desperate, I decided to try it. And I had enough of my old life contacts who were worried about me. I sent out a fundraising letter so I could afford it. Mm -hmm. so I got one and um had to make it work because it was everyone else's money <laughs> so that really spurred the uh the need to adapt and make it work and yeah it did. when you talk about adapting I think you're are you talking about off gassing and it, it, right. it wasn't ideal at the start so you had to just let it you know, get used to it I, or let it sit I, there? I had to off gas for quite a while. I had to figure out how to, you know, fit it to my head so it didn't didn't hurt my ears, figure out how to make it tighter so the air doesn't come across my ears, just a lot of adaptations like that. And then I started having, it's originally designed to be worn on a belt around your waist. And I started having back issues. So then I adapted again to uh, putting it on a cart and I'll show you that in a bit. Yeah, that'll be great. Thank you. And Kyle, um, did you similarly sort of try out a bunch of different kinds of masks? At what stage did you start to wear a full face mask? Yeah, I also started with the I Can Breathe mask and um, I've got all my things here. So if you want me to show them, um, I can do that. Do you want me to? Sure, why not? All right. So the I, I can breathe mask, which Mary and I, Marianne and I both started with, is a cloth mask like this. Right. Loops around your ears, not unlike what people were wearing for COVID. Um, we were ahead of our times. Uh, but there is a charcoal liner. This one has um, vent holes and uh, they also sell them without a vent hole. And the, the vents are a one-way valve so you can breathe you breathe in and your air comes in through the charcoal mask uh, which is covered by this guy uh, and then when you breathe out the valve opens so that you can breathe out and it just makes it makes breathing easier um, so I started with that um, being a scenic artist uh, in theater I know about respirators and um, I have my respirator from work that I used to use in work. So if I was spray painting something or using something toxic, which we tried not to do, I would go into the spray booth as well as wearing this. Yeah. Uh, right. And just so, for people who are listening, if I may, right. it's yeah, a half, half respirator. It's black in color. It has big 
filters, the round disc-like filters that are gray and black. So it's quite a big mask, vis highly visible. Yeah, so this is the half face respirator. Uh, there are a couple brands. There's a 3M is is uh, common. This one is a Northwell. Um, Northwell. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, Honeywell North mask. A different manufacturer, slightly different material. I just found that the Honeywell North fit my face better than the 3M. Uh, but I went through all of that when I was at work. So we had fit tests standing you know, the, in the industry. You are not allowed to let your employees wear a respirator without being sure that it's not going to hurt them and their health. So you have to be professionally fit tested and, and know how to wear it and know how to clean it and so on. Um, so, uh, and just so I'll, for those who are listening, um, if you have a half face mask and you want to make sure you have the right size, and unfortunately you cannot just try them on in a store, uh, you want to have it over your face and hold your hold hold a hand over the exhalation valve, which is the little valve in the front center down low. That's the exhalation valve. You try and breathe, you'll be able to breathe in, but you won't be able to breathe out. And similarly. You do the reverse, you put your hands over the external filters on either side of the mask, you breathe in and out, you'll be able to breathe out, but not in. And if you have that suction around the mask fitting to your face, then you have the correct fit. Um, so I knew this from work and I have this from work, but I you know, feel self-conscious wearing it. It's, it's, you know, it's like you wanna look like a bug, you wanna look like an alien. Uh, you know, it's it's hard psychologically, emotionally to wear these things. So I held off. I wore the I Can Breathe mask for um, a while. And I think it was probably about a year before I finally said, this is not cutting it any longer. And then I went to the to the uh, half face respirator. Um, I have a, a, a second half face respirator, which looks similar uh, and the only difference is that it has another uh, uh, attachment on the front of the mask, which is a speaking diaphragm. And so that allows people to hear me better when I'm wearing it. So talking, it has a vibrating thing that allows you to, to uh, yeah. talk and be heard a little bit better. So same thing about fit testing. Um, I did not have a problem with the off-gassing. Um, but I think I did wash it in baking soda and I left out in the sun just to, you know, do what I could, even though I didn't, I was not well bothered by the, the smell. Um, I know that I am less reactive than a lot of our cohorts in this disease. Um, and from the half face respirators, um, again, like I say, it was hard for me to, to start wearing it. I finally started wearing it. I started getting used to it, self-conscious embarrassed, um, hurt, you know, people are staring at you, people are turning around and looking at you, um, people are trying not to stare at you. It's, it's, you know, it goes all the ways. But I made myself wear it in a public situation, you know, if I was going to go in the store. By, by the, this time, I hadn't been going to the store for the year and a half prior. My husband was doing everything, right? So he was doing all the shopping, anything that had to go out of the home he would do. Um, but yeah, I hear you. So I mean, in our, if I could just say in our case, I relate, you know, we have two young children and I was just not going and being involved in their extracurriculars. And I came to a point where I said, no, I want to be involved in their lives, you know, yeah. and I don't want it all to fall on my partner. So, so similar to you, uh, I, I build up the courage, but I, I I'm, I'm interested in hearing you both talk about um, the challenges, right? Like the inner. Yeah. So maybe we can go there in a moment. But um, before we do, Kyle, do you want to show us your full yeah. respirator? Yeah. So um, I finally, you know, again, being in the industry, I knew about the PAPR. Uh, PAPR is P-A-P-R. It stands for Powered Air Purifying Respirator, which is what Marianne wears as well. Um, and I thought, you know, if I'm going to get out of the house and have another job, it's going to be teaching. I've taught in the past. That's going to be what I can do. I can't do that. We're in a half face respirator. I can, but I felt it, you know, it's a barrier. 
between me and the students. And theater, set design, construction, painting, props, all that is hands-on. I can't really teach that over the over the Zoom. Um, so I knew I had to get myself back into the physical right. space. So, so this I'm is just kind of counterintuitive, right? You know, like in my thinking, you know, the full face mask is more like it's it's a bigger setup. But in a way, you're saying it allows you to be to have easier communication with people. And I'm guessing yeah. because your face is visible, whereas the, the the half respirator, your mouth is covered. Right. And so I think, you know, I've asked my students, I'm sitting, I'm down on stage. My students are sitting in the audience of a theater while I'm doing a lecturing. And I've asked, can you hear me? Yes, they, they're, unless they're lying to me, uh, they say they can hear me. Um, and I think, yes, because they're seeing your full face inside the mask, right? So what I have uh, for a description of people listening is the, the uh, 3M VersaFlow papper. And when you call places, you'll, they'll refer to it as a papper as opposed to saying powered air purifying respirator. Uh, it is a, on a belt that I wear around my waist. It is heavy. As Marianne said, it, it, it is hard to wear because it's heavy. Um, I have two different batteries for it. One is a four hour battery and one's a 10 hour battery. So when one battery runs out, I can switch out the batteries and um, keep going. And then the mask uh, is a paper. What There's different kinds of masks. I have the disposable mask, but I wear it probably for not six months before I just dispose of it and change out to a new one because the face mask, the plastic shield on the front of the face mask will become scratched. Uh, and in my in, in situation, I get paint on it because yes, I am doing what I do. Um, but uh, so it's a paper hood that goes on over my head with elastic all the way around. I catch it on my chin, fold it over so that it's covering me like that. Now, I don't have it turned on right now, so it's getting a little steamy in there. But as soon as you turn it on, it's creating a positive air force. So the air is being, you have a battery pack here um, and a filter. And it's the same filter that I have on the respirator, which is the organic vapor filters, uh, which is what you need to take out the chemicals. Uh, the other filters without organic is not going to do it for you. Uh, there is a uh, There is a cartridge which in my industry we call the Defender, uh, which covers everything, organic and ammonia and something else, I believe. But anyway, this is the whole the whole filter. The situation is here. So the, the unit pulls the air in through the filter and through this hose up to the hood that I'm wearing. It's a positive air, so it's it's creating a bubble. It blows like it blows the hood up like a balloon. And uh, the air is just escaping around the edges. Uh, but this is very snug. I've actually had to go to a large instead of a small because the small was really choking me. Um, so that's how that works. Now I know when uh, with COVID going on, um, oh, that's what I want to talk to you about is with COVID, the, apparently these are not safe for other people when you are wearing it under a COVID situation because your boy, your breath is still escaping with the air. So I I wore it this way anyway. I knew that I was not exposed. I knew that I did not have COVID. So I was not concerned about passing something on to my to my uh, students or mm -hmm. co-workers. Got it. Uh, but for the half face respirator to make it compliant for COVID, you need to cover the exhalation valve, just like wearing a mask. So I would make a mask to put over that valve, which hooks around yeah. these guys. Um, so, and in this case, this one, I have one that's um, made out of a hospital grade um, paper mask, um, because when I had to do physical therapy, I had to wear this thing in there during COVID and they would not let me in without having something like that. And I said, I cannot do it without my pap, my uh, respirator. Mm -hmm. So I will make a mini mask over the exhalation valve. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so much, Kyle, for showing everything. Yeah. And that's really helpful. 
I don't think we've seen your papper yet, have we, Marianne? Oh, we Do you want to pop. show us? Sure. I'll turn it on and show you the headpiece first. Um, so mine is old, so the hose is discolored, but um, they usually come white. <laughs> Uh, Kyle has the current model that's being sold. Mine is now considered obsolete. Um, so I'm still finding uh, parts for it on eBay and things like that, but I can't call up 3M and order one anymore. So this is the headpiece. And as you can see, the hose comes, the hose comes into the back where the head, the base of the skull and so I also do like Kyle does, hold on to the chin piece and then tuck it back like that to put it on. And you can see, can you hear me? Yeah. 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 So you can yes. see how much easier it is to be heard through this than the other masks that they that I've had. Um, I had some trouble with it being too loose here and then I couldn't hear anything. So I tucked it, pulled it down so it's tight against the skin here, and then extra smell, extra air goes out here. But it's the same concept. The air comes, the clean air, I clean air comes up across here and comes out down here. So there's always a positive pressure. I don't smell anything outside unless there's a huge wind coming this way. But so that, very effective, very yeah. effective for you. Yeah. So Very I, helpful. I also like to dress it up a little bit with with hats and things like that to make it look a little less medical. <laughs> but because my because my back wouldn't take it wearing on the waist, I adapted it this way. Let me see if I can show it to you. This is a just a cart that carries luggage. And so I use the belt that goes around the waist to fasten the respirator motor and filter onto the cart and put the battery down here. Actually, I can carry two or three batteries if I want. And then I push it along beside me as I walk. Um, it's, uh, it keeps my arm strong because the lift of many batteries is heavy. Um, but that is what I've been using for many years now, and it works very well. I like it because, another reason I like it, because I can sit down and I don't, I'm not hitting anybody on the sides. Right. So that's not getting uh, hit, and I can put this in front of me or beside me or wherever it needs to be to get out of people's way. So, um, I bought a... Honda Element, which is a car that has doors that open like this. And there's yep. no, no bar in the middle. It's completely open space. So I can put this behind the seat and I can sit in the driver's seat and it works very well for that. So, so you drive with it. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. You can see perfectly why, you know, all the periphery and you turn your head easily. So yeah. Very interesting. If I don't drive with it, I get hit by the um, diesel fumes coming through the air system of the car, that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank and you so I, much for showing it. Yes, please go on. Then I start making bad decisions in driving if I <laughs> if I well, don't practice well, well, yeah. all. Well, yeah. So, yeah. so um, the, if we're talking about the ad, uh, psychological adaptation, when I first got it, I would talk to little kids. They would look up and see this and get scared. Um, it looks, you know, a little like something from a horror movie. And so I love little kids and to have them cry when they saw me and get scared when they saw me was just really, really hard. I had to figure out what to do about that. So I finally realized that they, they need to see my face. So when I talked to a kid, I would tuck my chin quickly so they would see my face instead of that white mm -hmm. slasher mask. <laughs> yeah, underneath at the chin area, there's a bit of a white uh, kind of fabric-y, plastic -y maybe material with holes in it, mm -hmm. vent area. Yeah, so Marianne's just tucking it in. So when you look down, 
children can see your face. Mm -hmm. Basically. Yeah. And Marianne, do you now, when you wear them, do you wear the mask, the, the, the popper, the full respirator every time you leave the house? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I might wear a smaller mask to walk to, you know, out the end of the driveway to get the mail, which isn't very far at all. But I don't go far beyond my door without wearing right. this. And I think you were mentioning when we spoke before, you live in a relatively smallish community. And so people, you know, you're the only person who wears one and everyone knows you. And was that helpful or kind of a, a, a hindrance in a way, being the only one or, you know, how did you, how were you met by people in your community? Uh, I made it work for me because I was, writing a personal column for the newspaper about being housebound basically and adjusting to mcs and recounting the many adventures from my travels in the past that kind of thing and so i had that platform to introduce myself to people and say i'm the new person in town wearing a mask and here's why and that was really helpful um, if the person didn't know, someone else knew and they could tell them. So that helped a lot. Um, and I got a lot of stares and a lot of people approaching me with their solutions, you know. Did you try this? Did you try that? Yeah. Uh, but after a while, people got used to, oh, that's that lady. And um, and then it was pretty pretty easy in my community. I went to New York City thinking it was going to be very hard Everybody there is weird, so nobody looked at me. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, yeah. No, oh, that's great. Um, <laughs> so let me, if I just pop please. in here, so I wear my papper for teaching, um, and again, as I say, I'm not as reactive to a lot of people, and I've been fairly stabilized early on. Luckily, um, I wear my half face respirator um, if I'm in the backyard and the neighbors are doing laundry, but if they're not doing laundry, I'm okay. I wear it to the store. Uh, I wear it. Um, I wear it around the school uh, or in the theater if we're doing uh, tech work uh, where I may not need a respirator. If I'm not around students and uh, co-workers, I don't need to wear a mask. I'm okay in the environment. Um, but if I go to the bathroom, I have to put it on. Um, and uh, so I, I will wear the respirator just hanging off the bottom of, you know, around my neck so I can quickly just slip it up over my my mouth and nose if I need to. But for teaching, I wear the papper um, again, so the students can see my face and they can hear me better. Uh, the downside is is it is heavy, and as you know, you're I wear it around my waist. Um, the first few days that I the couple, or a week that I had to wear it like seven hours a day, a lower back, feet we're really hurting. It's like, okay, I've got to stop <laughs> doing that. So I take it off when I can and wear the half face when I can. And at work, mm -hmm. you know, the, the students and the faculty now know me. They know that I wear this. And first day of class, I introduce myself, say, this is what I'm doing. This is why I'm wearing this. And, you know, hopefully it might tell the students about the dangers of wearing a lot of products. Mm -hmm. um, but they wear a lot of products. And uh, I said, mm -hmm. you'll either in this white thing looking like a spaceman uh, or a beekeeper, or you'll see me in the half face respirator. And this is to protect myself. And so they, mm -hmm. they accept that. And I know there are other students on campus who will see me wearing this who do not know what's going on, but I'm over that. Uh, mm -hmm. But that said, in a different situation, if I'm around family, I don't want to wear the mask. So I personally am struggling with the emotions and psychology behind wearing a mask like like the, you know, the half face respirator or the papper around family because mm. I know that some of them are going to be insulted by it you know insulted huh yeah that they they will think oh you think I'm stinky so you're wearing that it's funny oh. and it's interesting how people take offense to it when it's not meant it shouldn't be like that yeah, exactly. It's like, this is not about you. This is about me being protected by the products in, in the environment, you know? Yeah. Um, so like I say, at, at work, um, I kind of, I'm over it. I don't mind wearing these things. Uh, but, you know, the challenge is the weight, um, hearing the, the sound of the, of the fan on the papper 
interferes with my hearing the students or other people at times. So mm -hmm. I have to keep telling people to speak up. Mm -hmm. um, but like I say, the, the psychology behind wearing protective masking around family is something I mm -hmm. continue to struggle with. So once you started wearing the full respirator, Marianne, uh, were, were there any benefits? You know, were you able to do things you mentioned in, in life? Um, anything work-related that you were able to do that you, you hadn't been able to do up until that point? Well, just being able to go to the grocery store for myself was amazingly wonderful. <laughs> um, and that I had to build up to being able to do things like that. I could go back to church, actually. Um, and then I, um, the problem I have is that I have chronic fatigue syndrome, so I can't do a lot of things for a long period of time. But I did try teaching again with uh, with the full face mask on, and um, the the teaching was fine. Kids could hear me. Uh, my problem was the cell phones. You cannot get students to turn off their cell phones and keep them off for the entirety of a class period, and so that kept me from going back and doing more of that. But as far as the respirator went, that was they got used to that very quickly and um, were just as you know, poorly behaved as ever. <laughs> um, uh, I was teaching a high school class. <laughs> yeah, I asked you what grade you were teaching. Yeah, <laughs> high school one. Um, but I also am able to like this is one of the highlights. I loved going to conferences when I was a professional, and with the online teaching, there was a conference near me for that company. And I got to go. And so this is the respirator with a piece of luggage on it full of all the things I need to survive a day out. And mm -hmm. then, you know, I went shopping and I carried a coat. And so it looks like I have a bag. It looks like a whole lot more than what I usually go out with. But just the fact that I could go to Washington, D.C. to a conference center and attend a conference was so cool <laughs> and would not have been possible without the respirator i was lucky that my sister lives near there so i had a safer place to stay yes that's really great but and as you know like the thing about travel is where we can stay right kyle how about you um how did it change your life what were there any things specifically that you could do that you, you thought you might not be able to well, um, when I first got the PAPR and um, and I reached out to Marianne because I saw a picture of her on our on our Facebook uh, site, and so I said, like, "Okay, I'm, I'm thinking about this. Okay, I'm going to reach out to Marianne." And, and so she was my support system to start. You know, yep, there's another person doing this. I uh, did more research, found uh, what I wanted, and um, you know, the fact that you know someone else had been out there and been so brave. So thank thank you, Marianne. Uh, it's <laughs> It, it, but I, so I thought I was going to be able to wear it on an airplane, cannot wear it on an airplane because of the battery. The battery is not, it's a lithium ion battery, not allowed on the airplanes. So oh. cannot carry it. Uh, so I ended up wearing my half face respirator for the airplanes, um, which during COVID was challenging because they did not want to let that, you know, so my, luckily my husband was traveling with me and could help do the discussion. Um, uh, and every time we got on an airplane, you had to talk to the stewardesses there. I have a letter from my uh, occupational medicine doctor at Mount Sinai, which I carry with me. And, you know, thank God, you know, I, that helps, right? Because they would take it and it says necessary and uh, uh, compliance with ADA, right? So uh, both, systems, the PAPR and the half face have allowed me to be out in public, to go to the store, to get on an airplane, to go to a concert. Now, I, I, I don't wear, I only wear the PAPR at work. It allows me to teach. And that allowed me back in the classroom. That allowed me to be in public with more people for a longer time because wearing the respirator is hard to wear for a long time. Um, and so I can sit in, you know, theater technical rehearsals with incredibly fragrant opera singers in an entire, you know, just, oh, but I can do it, you know, and I, and the students got used to it quickly. They, I explained it to them, they, they accepted it. 
no problems. Um, but I have not felt the need for the PAPR in public and, but I've also not gained the confidence to wear the PAPR, but the, the half face, I have gone to a couple of concerts. I will get tickets at the very back of the house in case I need to escape. Um, and knowing that I'm going to change my shirt before I get into the car to go home and I'm going to wash everything and take a shower when I get home. Uh, but it's allowed me to, to, to do that kind of thing. Um, that mm -hmm. I do the same. I go to, um, you know, concerts and things. Um, and I, I do wear the big thing and I put a coat or something over the motor so yeah. that I'm not disturbing other people with the sound of the fan. That's that's my, been my concern is that uh, the sound of the fan um, I've thought would be too much, uh, too annoying for people sitting right around me. So I have not bothered with that. Yeah. Or well, I, have a, I have a big cape that I take along and just put over it and that muffles the sound a good bit. Um, I also have problems with my eyes reacting to everything, especially animals and birds. And everybody in my family has animals in their homes. So with this on, I can visit them at their homes. Without it, I wouldn't be able to. So that's been mm -hmm. um, yeah. when people come to my house, they know to come unscented and uncat and undog, <laughs> all of that kind of stuff. But um, when I go to their homes, there's no way they can clean it enough for me. And so that allows me to visit them there. Yeah. It's really interesting hearing you both talk about your experiences. And, and hearing you, I wonder if you have any thoughts about, do you think it could be helpful for other people who may be, you know, tuning in and, and listening or watching? You know, um, and, and if so, there are barriers, uh, you know, and it's it sounds like for you and, and I experienced that, too. I think we all do th the the challenges of, of wondering or experiencing the stares and the reactions from others. And for me, it's often a sense of isolation. You know, we're really othered and, and this, you know, we this will continue with this mask on. So. A, do you think it's how it could be helpful for others to continue working, to be in the world? And, and if so, what does it take? You know, are there some small steps that people can take to develop the, the confidence to do it, to wear it? And does it get easier over time? It does. It does. Um, I developed really quick answers to what do you have that on for? If a little kid is asking, I just say, it helps me breathe. And, you know, that's usually good enough for them. If their parent asks, I usually say I have many allergies. And so this helps me leave the house. I can't leave the house without it. Um, if someone's really interested, I'll, I'll give them the full spiel. But usually just that it's helping me breathe is helpful enough for, for curious people. I also make eye contact with anyone who's staring and give them a smile and that, that calms everybody down. Um, I had people say really odd comments about me being an alien. And so I just said, live long and prosper because that's <laughs> something Spock says on Star Trek and it made them laugh and then they were fine. Um, stuff like that. So, but it's, it's I'm talking, 19 years of using this that I've learned those trick techniques yeah yeah I do think other people would benefit from it and I'm sad that more people don't try it but it does I do know that in order for people to be to the point where they would like to do this they've already tried everything else and their money is gone and it's like two thousand bucks or so yeah that yeah, stuff so a lot of people the cost right the cost be yeah an issue and I always feel like if I had to do it to be in the classroom as an educator I'd probably ask my employer to cover the cost yeah right. you know yeah it's yeah a small, small price to pay for freedom it's a small price to pay for freedom but it's still a lot of money it's a lot of money and, yeah, yeah. When, when I was buying my setup you cannot buy one filter at a time you have to buy a case of filters so the filters are what fifty dollars a piece, something like that. The hoods you cannot buy one hood; you have to buy a case of hoods. Uh, so between the machine itself and then getting the additional 
equipment and the spare battery uh, and getting, you know, all additional costs. So, yeah, it was about 2500 I think, for the whole setup. Mm -hmm. Now I've got a lot of filters and I've got, you know, the backup batteries and I've got a lot of hoods. So I don't need to buy anything more for a while. Um, but that's a big outlay for a lot of people. And I am very lucky and, and grateful that I have financial support from, from my parents uh, to right. help me some of these situations because, you know, I lost my job and, you know, and my husband's been very supportive. You know, he's been like, do what you need to do to heal. Um, but it allows me to be out there. And uh, yeah, I think it's, yes, it's hard. It's hard to get over the barriers of the emotional and the psychological and the physical. Uh, it, it's a much better physical barrier than you'll ever find. It's, it's really the only physical barrier that's truly gonna help people. Uh, but on, on, I would like to warn people that if you have asthma, if you have any breathing issues, please do not wear a respirator without medical support. Make sure your, your doctor clears you physically to wear a respirator because it is hard on your lungs to pull the air through the respirator filters the papper is supplying the air. It is no pressure on your lung system whatsoever. It's a positive air. But the half face can cause stress on your body to breathe through it. Um, and do not run through an airport as I did once wearing it. You're not supposed to do that, but I know that. And I did it anyway to try and catch a plane. Uh, but um, Please, please be careful of your own health if you decide to try a half-face respirator. Yeah, I do have asthma, and I found the half-face respirator was really hard to pull in the air through, especially fast enough if I was walking or something like that. Yes. And yeah. with this one where it's, you know, sending the air to you, you it's very easy breathing. Yeah. Understood. Yeah. May I ask you, do you think the technology will evolve? You know, you know, Marianne, you've been wearing it for 20-ish years, Kyle for a number of years. Um, it seems like the technology hasn't really progressed, but we know more and more people are going to develop MCS and other issues. There's wildfire smoke increasingly becoming of an issue, pollution, you know, I, I think someone, some a company is going to ultimately and hopefully soon uh, develop uh, a product that will be um, that won't be as heavy that will do a really great job that will filter the air for us and will be attractive looking yes. more attractive like and I'm actually you know surprised in a way that the masks you wear um, it's really you know they don't look like a big deal at all you know, I know there's a lot involved, um, but in a way, again, they're less visible to my eye than the half respirator. But right. do, you, do you have yeah. any thoughts on like how you wish or think the technology may evolve as we go forward? It it will evolve. I saw um, I saw a respirator that was, and actually, my dermatologist told me of this one. Um, it, it's a like a half face mask, half face respirator, it covers your nose and mouth, but it came around to the neck and it was all built in kind of like a um, a ring that you wore around your neck and it was self-contained. And I was very close to getting one until I found out that you cannot recharge the batteries and oh. it's all built in. So you have to plug in the unit to recharge it, which means I can't wear it while it's recharging. So, you know, it, it visually, less of an impact talking would still be an issue because you're talking through the half face but i think there's as the need for people to have of the public to have this kind of uh equipment um i think they will evolve i am afraid it will be a long time just because there's not enough of us out there because our disability is not recognized by the mainstream medical field um because air pollution is not so bad yet that we can't leave our apartments to go outside for normal people. Okay. Uh, there's, I don't think there's enough of an industry yet for them to 
really march at that quickly. Um, but I, I think it will happen, but it's going to be a while, I think. I was very excited over COVID to see all the experimentation with masks. I was like, this hopefully will lead to something really good. Uh, I did not see any mask that was good for COVID that I could wear because the filters were never strong enough. Right. But just the fact that someone was looking at that and looking at something for people to wear every day to go to work and such made me excited. I hope that it 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 has it has a future. Yeah. Great. Thank you so much. Is there anything else you'd like to share with us? Aaron, what do you wear for a mask? Right. Well, thanks for asking. So um let me pause. I'll just get it. Okay. I'm so excited, Kyle, that you can keep working. Yeah, it's uh, it's uh, and you know, Marianne, I'm I'm so stabilized that I'm testing it out. I'm I'm not wearing my mask as much, and seeing what I can tolerate, and I'm doing pretty well. But uh, well, that's an I, ideal situation. I damaged by the time I got it, I don't expect to get. Yeah, it. yeah, and I know you know my but my inner fear is that every time I'm exposed, I know every time I'm exposed to stuff, I'm doing more damage to myself. So, am I doing damage that's going to be permanent? Um, and I know it's 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 affecting me even if I don't know it's affecting me, right? It's just that catch twenty two <laughs> that we live with. Yeah. So, so thanks for asking me. This is the mask that I wear. Uh, I used to, like you, wear an I Can Breathe, and uh, my condition got, you know, worse and worse over the years. And so now, whenever I leave the house, um, I use this 3M half respirator, and um, I cup it. So I just don't wear it all the time. I just, I take my in-breaths with it. Um, yeah. why? Well, because I get a lot of stares. Um, I take my kids to school and pick them up every day. And there are a lot of stares from children. There are a lot of parents who don't talk to me because, you know, I, they were parents who I was friends with, who no longer talk to me. Uh, so I certainly feel the the judgment. Uh, it's painful. It's it's yeah. difficult to deal with that. Uh, my kids are great. My kids are so supportive. Um, but um, but yeah, I, like you, you know, this has given me essentially a lot of freedom. You know, and and not being ill. Like when I don't bring it, I'm I get ill a lot. Uh, my triggers in just around where we live are tend to be dryer sheets and laundry fumes, you know, just pretty much everywhere. And this covers me for that. So it's been so it's been a gift for myself, just not having to be just not being ill a lot. And um, so it's worth it for me. There really is no other way at this point. Um and if I do have to go back to the classroom, then uh, this is really not an option. You know, the fragrances in the classroom are so strong. So it'll probably be, I hope I can continue to teach online. And the podcast is great because it's all online. Um, but if I have to go back to the classroom, it'll, I don't know. I really, really struggle with the idea of wearing it. It mask. would be a powered air <laughs> respirator, but I, um, I would, I feel anxious thinking about it. Uh, and I feel, would feel anxious wearing it with family too. So on both fronts, it would be difficult for me. It would be difficult to bring this into, into the classroom and the full. So you're much stronger than me, uh, but it you're was... an inspiration. And, uh, I have seen, you know, photos you've shared over the years on social media, um, about your experience wearing full respirators and uh, it's been really helpful um i see you both as leaders through your example so thank you so much for for modeling this for us it's really a gift it's really helpful and i'm really grateful to both of you for sharing everything that you've shared with us on the podcast you're welcome asking yeah it's it's important to get this information out and um um, I hope I hope people will find it helpful and 
try and take those steps out of the house. It's it's hard. It's scary, but you can do it. Yeah, and, it, and, it yeah. and it gets easier. It gets easier and easier. Absolutely. Well, don't expect it to work magically first. You have to. Yeah, baby steps. Right. Right. And because of the off gassing, and it may not work for everyone. I'm it guessing, is. right? Yeah. Because of the products they that are they're made from, yeah. some people just may never be able to use. It, I'm I'm thinking right. Would you agree? Uh, this this plastic scares a lot of people, but it's a very hard plastic that it does it takes very few days to off gas. Yeah. Uh, the, this was the worst part. The tubing. And, yeah, the tubing. But it's gotten much better. Uh, Kyle said she didn't have trouble with hers. Yeah. Uh, you know, again, I'm not as reactive, but I, I you know, when, when, I when I got this, I was prepared to. So soak, soak it in things and sit in the sun, you know, and it's like, I am not smelling anything. And, you know, maybe it was still affecting me, but I was not aware of it. I think yeah. they have changed it. Uh, over yeah. Yeah, it's a different, it is a different material that's made out. Well, and my hope, you know, in terms of the technology as, as it evolves is that a company or companies use recyclable, biodegradable, non-toxic products in making these masks. Yeah. You know, because, uh, and some of these companies have a, a long history of, you know, that I'm not going to go into, but, you know, it's, it's really unfortunate that we have to spend our financial resources, you know, on products designed by companies that actually do a lot of harm to the planet. Yeah. You know, it's a really unfortunate thing. Uh, so my hope is that someone really innovative will will invest the time and energy you know and the brain power to come up with products that are not harmful for the planet and helpful for us and i think it's just a matter of time mm -hmm. uh, these are designed for normal people in highly toxic situations and it works for a hypersensitive person in a quote normal situation uh, because of that so i also wanted to just say that i Wearing the powered respirator uh, makes me look more strange, but feel more normal because I can be independent. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's something that people don't get on the outside. And I totally, that really resonates with me too. When I first started uh, trying to be friendly towards kids, I put a sticker of Sandy, the squirrel from Sponge SpongeBob SquarePants. Mm -hmm. on my respirator because she's in a bubble she's a squirrel that lives at the bottom of the ocean she can't live in her world without going out in a bubble everywhere she goes and right. um, so that was that was helpful for for kids to I would just say I'm like Sandy and they would know what I meant <laughs> right oh well, that's perfect that's great mm -hmm. well listen it's been it's been wonderful talking with you. Thank you again for taking time and for everything you've shared. And Thank I think it's going to be really, I think it's going to be really valuable for people. Thanks for doing the podcast. Yeah. It's a pleasure. That brings us to the end of this episode of the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast. Thank you very much to Kyle Higgins and Marianne Martin for speaking with me. The podcast is produced by me, Aaron Goodman, and Rainy Novak. We release new episodes twice a month. Please subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the podcast and want to support it, please find links on the website and in the show notes. Your help allows us to continue making the podcast and create greater awareness about MCS. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And find us on social media. Just search for the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast or Podcasting MCS. Leave your comments about anything you hear on the podcast and please share the podcast with others. If you'd like to read transcripts of the podcast, you can go to the podcast website, chemicalsensitivitypodcast.org. Click on the episode you want and then click on transcript. Or you can find the Chemical Sensitivity Podcast on YouTube and read captions in any language you like. Please leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's a great way to help others learn about the podcast. And if there's someone you'd like to hear interviewed on the podcast or a topic you'd like us to explore, just let us know. Email info at chemicalsensitivitypodcast.org. And thanks for listening.